Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The Korean family, how it functions and what it looks like, has fundamentally changed over the course of the past decades. The traditional extended family model has given way to the nuclear family and its variants. And Korean society has become more diverse with inter-ethnic marriages more common now than ever before. These changes are not only complex, but also carry profound implications for the Korean society. To learn more about these societal dynamics, we met with Professor Paul Y. Chang. We talked about the demographic revolution that is currently taking place in Korea, how the government has tried to control the nation's fertility rate since the middle of the 20th century, and the challenges it now faces as a result of its past policies. Professor Paul Y. Chang is Associate Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. He received his PhD in Sociology from Stanford University in 2008. Professor Chang has published several book chapters and articles in various academic journals, including Mobilization, Sociological Forum, Asian Perspectives, and the Journal of Korean Studies. His current project focuses on the emergence of non-traditional family structures in South Korea, including single-parent households, single-person households, and multicultural families. Three years ago, we spoke to you about democratization movements in South Korea during the 1970s. Today, we're talking about a different topic, the evolution of Korean families over the course of the past decades. You recently wrote a paper on the issue. What got you interested in this new topic? I've always been interested in the family as a sociologist. Um, we study, sociologists study politics, the economy, and society generally. Um, I think what really sparked my interest was just reading the news and uh, reading about these dramatic trends that were happening in Korea. Um, as most things in Korea, things happen quite fast. And before the modernization period, so before, let's say, the 1960s, Korea had one of the lowest divorce rates, for example, in the developed world or in the developing world, and now has one of the highest. So the first issue that caught my eye was the divorce rates and how rapidly the divorce rates had increased in the past few decades. Uh, and then I, and as I started getting into it, I realized that the family change in Korea have been quite dramatic. There's the macro change from the extended family structure to the nuclear family structure. But now what we're seeing is quite diverse family forms emerging uh, that uh, not only contradict or not only challenge existing norms and values and expectations of family formation, but also really challenge the normative aspect. That is to say, uh, what people think of as what's right or correct in terms of family formation. And so these household structures, these new household structures, for example, uh, single parent households, mostly single mother households, or uh, single person households, people who are just foregoing marriage at all, never marrying, these are quite dramatic changes and also the multicultural families, which is not necessarily non-normative uh, in the global context, but in Korea, a country that professes to be mono-ethnic or ethnically homogeneous, uh, interracial or interethnic marriages is quite a dramatic new form of marriage. And finally, what's happening with the senior citizens, although senior citizens themselves are not non-normative, uh, what's happening to them in terms of their social isolation and their physical isolation uh, and the poverty rates and the suicide rates amongst them is quite non-normative and quite, it's really things that uh, Korea has never seen before. As you write in your recent paper, the expectations that South Koreans have towards the idea of family have changed significantly over the past decades. Could you briefly summarize how the idea of family today differs from that of Korea a few generations ago? It's really hard to measure um, change in ideas and values. Um, I think uh, one way and one indirect way of getting at it is uh, not so much trying to measure uh, ideas about the family, but what actually has um, transpired in terms of family change. Uh, as a reflection of potential attitudes and family values that are changing over the course of the last few decades. Uh, I think one of the most dramatic uh, manifestations of family change has been the changing uh, household size over time. And if we think about the number of people that constituted a household in 1960, for example, almost 50%, 48.2% of families had 
uh, six or more persons in the household, in a single household. So that basically meant two things. One, you have a lot more multi-generational families. So you have quite possibly three generations, which is to say the grandparents living with grandchildren. Uh, but also you have more children overall, so that the average household, is, again, was about six people per household in 1960. And that constituted 48.2% of all households. Now, in 2015, uh, only 1.4% of all households have six or more people. Um, on the flip side of that story is um, households that had two people uh, in 1960, that constituted about 7.1% of all households. And now in 2015, or at least in 2015, 26.3% of all households are only two people. And remarkably, in 2015, 26% of all households are one-person households. So if you combine those two, then in 2000, since 2015, more than half of all households in Korean society are either one-person or two-people households. And the two-person households could either be a couple without children, potentially, or mother and child for single mother households, for example. We don't know uh, the further breakdown, but we do know that the total total household size has changed dramatically and decreased in size dramatically over the last uh, decade, over the modernization period. I think, I mean, people might call that, in Europe, they might call that the modernization of families. But I think the household size speaks volumes about uh, what we consider to be uh, important in terms of family formation, the choices we make about marriage and having children, uh, and also taking care of our elderly. So it's hard to gauge uh, people's attitudes about family, but we do know for sure that the family has changed dramatically in recent years. The term demographic transition is normally used in the West to describe a decrease in mortality and a decrease in fertility. Is this what we are actually witnessing in Korea? So what I would probably say is that what we're seeing in Korea is not only a demographic transition, but probably we can call it a demographic revolution. And I use that word revolution purposefully because one of the definitions of revolution is fundamental change in the basic structures of society. And I think that's what we're seeing now. When we look at the literature on the quote unquote quote, second demographic transition in European families or even in American families, the key markers of that demographic transition are, uh, for example, later age of marrying. Uh, people are marrying at a lower rate than other. So there's a greater proportion of people who are not marrying. And people are having a lot less children. So the fertility rate has dropped tremendously. At least in the European context, also people are having children outside of marriage. So out-of-wedlock births is really high. Uh, I, I believe actually in France, uh, there are more babies being born outside of marriage now than there are within marriage and within the marriage context, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and also in the European context, cohabitation, the percentage of partners who live together without marrying, that's also quite high. Uh, when we look at the East Asian context, um, we can see a lot of the similar trends that are happening in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, China slightly different because of their state intervention and family planning with the one-child policy, so we can bracket that. But in these other East Asian contexts, uh, you see a lot of the sim a lot of the same kinds of trends. So you see later age of marrying, uh, which now, at least in the South Korean context, for men it's above 32 years old, the average age at first marriage, and for women it has uh, now reached over 30 years old, which is quite remarkable. And also people are having a lot less children. The fertility rates at least in 2017, it's, it was dropping significantly. But in 2017, something remarkable happened. The fertility rate dropped to its lowest ever in South Korea. And it was 1.05 children per female. So that is quite remarkable, given that the population replenishment rate has to be above 2, about 2.1. So actually what we're seeing is negative population growth. I heard from my Taiwanese colleagues recently that in one year in Taiwan, the fertility rate had dropped even less than one, which is really remarkable. But in any case, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, South Korea, and Japan have really, really low fertility rates, which is another marker of the second demographic transition. 
One thing to note, though, a difference between East Asia context or East Asian nations and Europe, and I think this speaks volumes about the potential mechanisms that are driving this family change, is that you do not see high rates of cohabitation in East Asia, and you do not see high rates of -of out-of-wedlock births. So you do see high rates of divorce, you have higher age of marriage, a lot less children being born, the the smaller family size, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, You see all these things, but these two key markers, I think, are really, really essential to understanding what's happening in East Asia versus uh, Europe, because the second demographic transition literature is, or theory is not just a descriptive theory about what's happening in Europe, for example, but also trying to explain what's happening. And one of the explanations for these new family trends is that there's new values that young people have adopted, values of individualism and freedom and liberty. People would rather have a free life as opposed to being tied to to uh, historical institutions like marriage. And so cohabitation and having children out of wedlock, these things are seen as indicators of free choice. But the fact that we don't see them in East Asia, I think, again, speaks volumes to the potential differences uh, in the motivations or the mechanisms that are driving this. Based on my preliminary research, I don't think that what's driving family change in East Asia is about freedom and liberty and um, free choice. It's really about a precarious economy and the difficulty of being able to afford families, or at least for women, the difficulty in having a healthy work-life balance so that uh, women who want to maintain their careers are unable to do so if they have a lot of family duties, partly because as Korean men do not really help out in the house in regards to household chores. Uh, so I think what's driving uh, the family change or the demographic revolution in East Asia, uh, the motivations are quite different than what's happening in Europe, although when we look at the macro trends, we do see similar patterns. What are the implications for the Korean society of these changes to the Korean family structure? Um, so I think the I think that is the crucial question. It's not just that the family is changing, but I think um, the kinds of trends that we're seeing in South Korea and again in East Asia generally are so compelling because it's fundamentally going to reshape what Korea is and what Korean society is. So, for example, uh, one of the consequences of having such low fertility rates and people living longer generally is what we're they're calling a super aging society. Uh, Japan's been on a super aging societal trend for a while, but Korea is quickly catching up. And so, in about 20, 30 years, when you look at the population pyramid of the proportion of uh, people in certain age groups, you'll see that right now, or 20 years ago, it looked like more like a triangle with a lot of young people and fewer older people. Right now, it looks more like kind of a diamond shape. Uh, but over time, what we're going moving towards is a reverse triangle uh, so that we're going to have a lot of old people at the top and, and very few young people at the bottom. That obviously is going to have implications for the labor force participation uh, and whether or not society is going to be able to support such a high proportion of older people. Uh, we might think about whether pensions are going to last, at least in the American context, Social Security, health insurance, and on and on. So I think that's one of the larger macro implications of of family change. There are a lot of other important manifestations of family change. The fact that people are marrying less. When we when we break it down a little bit further, we can see that it's not that everybody is marrying less. There are certain groups that are more likely not to marry. Uh, for example, upper class or highly educated women tend to marry less than their lower educated counterparts. And also on the flip side of that is lower educated men or lower class men are not marrying as much as higher class men. And that is important because that has led to secondary consequences, at least for the lower class men. They're starting to outsource their marriage partners outside of Korea, partly because the government has sponsored marriage tours initially. But now it's diversified. Not only uh, are they looking for brides in China with the Chosunjok or the Korean Chinese, but also now they're looking uh, in Southeast Asia. And so in 2005, Uh, At its peak, 13.6% of all marriages in Korea were between um, different ethnic groups or different racial groups. That is, say, international marriages, which is quite remarkable. Uh, And after that peak, it plateaued for a while at about 10%. It's dropped now to about 7 8% of all marriages, but that's still quite remarkable because that's basically saying that about 1 in 10 marriages are between a Korean and a non-Korean person or an international marriage. 
one of the consequences of that is currently, or in 2015 anyway, there are over 300,000 marriage migrants in Korea, the great majority of them being women, and they're starting to have children. And I think that's another consequence. So when we think about the large implications of this, um, when we think about the number of biracial children in 2012, it was already over 168,000 children, biracial children in Korea. In 2008, 2.9% of all births were from these quote-unquote multicultural families. But in 2014, that number, that percentage had grown to about 5%. So 5% of all children that were born in South Korea were uh, from these multicultural families. Or another way of saying it is that they're biracial children. I think that's important because in the future, uh, with these greater proportion of the population being categorized as these multicultural families and the greater numbers of biracial children being born from them, I think Korea and Koreans are going to physically look different. And that's why I think this is such a compelling issue. It's not just uh, these trends that we're seeing, but these trends are manifestations of a fundamental shift in uh, social and family formation such that I think Korea is going to be a physically different place based on the phenotype of Korean people. In your writings, one of the explanations you give to these changes is the Korean government, or rather past Korean governments. You give a twofold explanation, one that is economic and another that is political. Starting with the economic side of things, how did Korea's rapid economic growth since the 1960s impact the former families? Uh, I think um, demographers have been quite good about showing uh, these demographic trends over time. I think what I want to do in this project is to hopefully add to that uh, discussion by uh, highlighting the historical foundations of demographic change, specifically, as you mentioned, the economic and political story. When we think about state-led development in the 1960s, 70s, obviously the economic story is the most salient one. And then also the political democratization that we saw in 1987 or in the 80s and continuing today, uh, that seems to be the other salient story of South Korea. I think what we forget is um, that these economic and these, well, I think, well, I, w- I would like to argue is that the economic uh, modernization in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and the political democratization in the 80s and continuing to this day are fundamentally tied in direct ways to the social demographic revolution that we're seeing today. Uh, and so I'd like to spell some of that out in this project, or I'm trying to spell some of that out in this project. So, for example, um, the government has always been in the business of affecting family. And not to say, not, not, not necessarily because they had I, strong ideas about what an ideal family was, but they realized that family formation was a fundamental part of the economic development uh, goals that they were trying to achieve. So, for example, in the 1960s, when the family, when the fertility rate was over five children, that is to say how uh, Korean households were having on average more than five kids, the government really tried, ironically, uh, I mean, in hindsight, it's ironic, but to try to try to limit the number of children children that Korean families were having. So they started all of these campaigns urging Korean families to have two children. Um, And the campaign slogan was, it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl, let's try to have two kids and let's try to raise them well. Uh, And that campaign was quite salient in going into 1970 when the fertility rate had dropped between 4.5 to 2.9 children. And then in the 1980s and 1990s when the fertility rate, the actual fertility rate was still hovering at about 2.5 children, the state uh, doubled down on their policy and they actually were encouraging families to have only one child. Uh, And the slogan there, so if you look at the campaign posters, the slogan was, uh, let's not uh, distinguish between a boy or a girl. Let's just have one child and raise that child well. Or even if we have a daughter, let's try to raise her well as opposed to raising 10 sons. Or I'm not envious of having 10 sons. So these posters were quite ubiquitous. um, And you can sort of see them around. I heard uh, from a couple of interviews that uh, some of the older people, they remember seeing these posters on buses, for example. So they'd get on a bus and there would be these uh, government campaign posters about having less children. The reason why, I mean, obviously that changes now um, in starting the 2000s because the fertility rate had dropped so low, and now the, now the government is trying to encourage people to have more kids. But the point is that the government has always been in the business of trying to affect family formation. And the reason why the government needed uh, smaller families is because they thought that this was conducive to uh, economic modernization. So it was really tied to the economic modernization story. And as part of 
increasing per capita income as part of their macro export goals, uh, and also their middle class aspirations. Uh, so they realized that um, agrarian societies, you have large families, partly because you need a lot of children to work on the farms, but in a modern economy, um, the nuclear family is the ideal family size in terms of two children, maybe two parents and two children. And so it was really tied into the government's uh, middle class aspirations for its country. I'm not sure whether or not these campaigns to lower the fertility rate actually had an effect. From my general sort of preliminary archival work, I don't feel like it has because I feel like, honestly, the government has been sort of like five or ten years behind to actual fertility trends. I think probably more than these sort of campaigns, what fundamentally affected family formation was the change in the economic structure of society. Uh, So as part of the economic story, you get rapid urbanization rates uh, where people are coming out of the countryside, especially young people are coming out of the countryside to go work in the factories in the cities during the developmental period. So for example, in the 1960, uh, less than 30 percent of the Korean population were living living in urban centers. But by 1985, that had jumped up to about 70%, and now over 80% of Koreans live in urban centers. So uh, as people move away from the countryside and move into cities, uh, they tend to live in smaller units physically. So for example, when you look at the breakdown of the architectural space, you can see that the apartments in the cities are built for smaller size families. But also you get a separation from usually younger people who are working in factories, uh, living away from their more elderly parents who stay behind in the countryside. Um, So I think that urbanization, which accompanied industrialization, I think that had a huge impact on family formation and household size. Um, The second thing that was um, related to the economic story that had an impact on family formation was the expansion, which dramatic, dramatic expansion of tertiary education or greater opportunities for Korean young people to go to college. For example, in 1980, uh, less than 20, that's quite remarkable to think about it now, but in 1980, less than 23% of Korean women, uh, female high school graduates, were matriculating into college. In 1980, the rate for men uh, was about 30%. Now, Korea has one of the highest matriculation rates in the entire world, hovering at about 70 to 75% of all high school graduates go on to college, which is quite remarkable. Obviously, one of the consequences of going to college is that uh, you're going to try to turn that educational investment, that human capital, into um, a career. So even for women, for example, if they go to college, um, not many of them want to, after college anyway, settle, marry, and just stay home. I think most uh, young people, young women want to work. The choice to work and the choice to go to college itself has directly impacted the age at first marriage. So the age of so marrying basically is getting pushed back uh, initially because of school to finish school, but now to start their careers. And again, because when once you have um, people marrying later, then people are having children later, and people are having fewer children overall. So the point I was trying to make in the paper was to try to historically contextualize the demographic revolution that we're seeing today by uh, showing that it is a latent consequence or w- one of the lame byproducts of the economic story that we're seeing that started, the economic planning story that started in the 1960s and carried into the 1970s, uh, particularly looking at urbanization and the expansion of higher education. The data that I have shows that, for example, in 1963, about 37% of women were working And now in 2014, about a little over half, so over 50% of women are working. Actually, that's relatively a low female labor force participation rate compared to Western nations. But when we break it down, what's interesting about the Korean trend is that when we break it down by um, age group, we can see that it's not a linear pattern or it's not a, it's not a, it's not a stable pattern over a life course of a woman. Uh, so, for example, in the in their twenties, over seventy percent uh, women in the age group of twenty five twenty nine are working. Uh, that percentage drops dramatically in their thirties to fifty five percent and then comes back up in their 40s to about 64, 65, 67 percent. This pattern um, is called in the literature the classic M-curve. 
uh, so that you have high labor force participation, then low labor force participation in their 30s, and then and tries to pick up again. And obviously, uh, the reasons for women exiting the labor force in their 30s is to start families. Uh, and the the steepness of that drop from the 20s to the 30s is steeper than uh, most any comparable country, even compared to other East Asian countries, which shows or is one manifestation of the fact that Korean women have a harder time balancing work and life than even in other contexts. I think that's a key statistic to see the kinds of challenges that Korean women are facing. Apart from the economic development in South Korea, you also see the political changes in the country, and especially democratization in the late 1980s, as a source of the changes that the idea of family underwent. Um, could you elaborate on that? So as I uh, mentioned earlier, it's notoriously difficult to try to gauge or try to empirically observe change in values and attitudes. Uh, I mean, obviously, people try, and there are ways that you know people do do it. Uh, I think that change in family values is one of the critical things to help us understand why there has been such dramatic change in family formation. So this project is based on over 200 interviews with different groups. Uh, and when I was interviewing the never married and the single parent households, they would tell me things like, today, people tend to pursue individualism as opposed to sacrificing for the nation and for the family. And I thought that was interesting because it spoke to, again, changing attitudes about where the values are. So historically, when we think about it, I tried to track uh, when was it the first time you get an entry or a real saliency of this idea of individual pursuit of happiness. Because when we look at the 1960s and 1970s, the dominant narratives uh, was really about sacrifice. So sacrificing individual pursuit of happiness for the nation state. And in the 80s, uh, when you talk to the student protesters of the 80s who are now much older, obviously, they'll tell you that they would sacrifice their individual goals for the nation, in this case, fighting for democracy. And um, Nami Lee, in her book on the Minjung movement, for example, talks about the thousands of students who dropped out of college to basically become workers to help politicize uh, the workers and start a labor proletariat revolution. And so if, at least up to 1987, the dominant narratives have been to sacrifice for the nation, either by contributing to the economic modernization program or for the fight for democracy, it was really, I think, uh, after 1987, where you get for the first time the ability or the, uh, the possibility for Koreans to think beyond sacrifice and to really pursue individual pursuit or individual happiness. Um, and I really think if we sort of historically periodize this, I really think that the period between 1987 when Korea transitions to democracy and 1997, exactly 10 years when uh, you have the Asian financial crisis, is really a key decade to understanding uh, change in values. So what happens after 1987 is uh, once you have political democratization, you get all sorts of freedoms that uh, were not afforded to Koreans before. The government lifts the travel bans that allows people to travel. Before 1987, uh, you had to get the government permission to travel, and the people that were traveling were either diplomats or business actors or sometimes students who would go to America to study in graduate school to come back to help build the country. After 1987, however, those travel bans are lifted, and people for the first time, in mass numbers anyway, are allowed to travel for leisure. And also, I just to, just to background what's happening in the 1990s is from 1987 to 1997, it is a period of incredible economic boom. So uh, the economy was booming and growing. And uh, th again, this is before the Asian financial crisis. And so Koreans not only had new political freedoms, but they also had the money to travel. You get a surge in consumption culture. And, and with the rise of the middle class that began, that began actually in the 1980s, but really the middle class coming into its own in the 1990s. 1990s, they're starting to really flex their muscles, their economic muscles, by really enjoying themselves and enjoying traveling abroad and also consuming international cultures internally, domestically, by importing uh, Japanese and American media and movies and films, for example. Um, I also think another indicator that's telling of this period is the incredible expansion of the leisure industry during this time. 
So when we look at the economic sectors that were growing, the leisure industry was was one of those uh, areas that were growing a lot. And partly because, again, Koreans were enjoying newfound freedoms. They were learning how to enjoy themselves, and they had the money to do so. All of that obviously comes to a head in uh, 1997 with the Asian financial crisis. But before the financial crisis, you really get the middle class coming into its own. And also during the 1990s, you get for the first time this new phrasing, Shinsede uh, Muna, which is the new generation culture, uh, which was a way to try to demarcate or identify this new attitude towards life. And, I, and also part of the uh, new political freedoms was the lifting of the censorship laws. Uh, and so you get all sorts of culture coming in. And I just wanted to mention, uh, for those who are older, you might remember this, but this is also the period when Sateji and the boys and the birth of K-pop, uh, when all these Western genres of music and film were coming into Korea. So again, Koreans, I think, I think the 1990s or more specifically from 1987 to 1997, was really a critical 10-year period to try to understand a shift in culture away from sacrifice for nation and family and towards individual pursuits of happiness. Obviously, it's not to say that the families, traditional families didn't uh, you know, fell apart overnight or anything like that, but this new attitude towards family formation. And just one last note about that is also it's in, it's in the 1990s where you get the increasing saliency of the phrase love marriages. Uh, that, I think, is um, reflective of this new belief in choice and that even in the realm of family formation, uh, instead of uh, letting our parents decide who we're going to marry, uh, it was a way for younger people to exercise their free will and individual pursuits by uh, insisting on uh, love as an important criterion for uh, choosing uh, partners. An important factor you mentioned that happened a bit later is the IMF crisis. And you wrote that, and I quote, it is clear that if we imagine the 1997 financial crisis as a tunnel, Korea as a whole emerged on the other side fundamentally altered. How did this affect Korean families and their structure? The Asian financial crisis, I think, was such a pivotal moment. It was one of those uh, moments where you can probably, I mean, this might be an over-exaggeration, but really think about Korea, South Korea before the Asian financial crisis and South Korea after, and those were two qualitatively different things now. I mean, everyone knows the story about how it changed the economy and patterns of labor formation such that you get new neoliberal economic policies pervading Korea's business sectors and government policy even. I think what we see after the Asian financial crisis was the catchphrase is a heightened sense of precariousness or precarity. And these things are manifest, and for example, in high unemployment rates, high suicide rates, uh, hyper-competitive educational culture, increasing polarization of the wealth distribution so that you get a declining uh, size of the middle class and you get the richer becoming richer and the poorer becoming poorer. I think all of these things fundamentally affect decisions about family formation people in during our inter- our interviews with the never married population when we ask them and we ask the men especially what what are the reasons why you don't want to marry or you chose not to marry or you can't marry they'll tell me that a lot of it has to do with the um, housing situation there's no way that they can afford housing in Seoul City. Uh, therefore, no Korean woman would probably want to marry them. And that's actually a quote from several of the interviewees that we talked to. On the flip side, for women, they've told us that because it's so important to have double income, they have to work. And even if they do marry, now to survive in Korean society, you need dual income. So the husband works and the wife works. And if the wife works, then they can't have two, three, four children. And they chose to, again, maybe have one child and raise that child well as opposed to having multiple children. and Or, on the flip side, maybe not even having children at all. Um, so there is an increasing proportion of couples who decide not to have kids, and part of that is an economic calculation. For the never-marrying population, for the women at least, I've had interviewees tell me that they would rather pursue 
their career because uh, working and family is so difficult to do at the same time in Korean society. And it sounded to me like that was also an economic calculation in this new uh, precarious economy. So I think the Asian financial crisis is one of those things where it just pervades everything. And the fundamental changes in the economy has uh, secondary and third consequences for other things like family formation and just general uh, relationships overall. But most of the reason why I think we're seeing these new non-normative family structures is being driven by uh, economic considerations. That's a big part of the story. Not all of it, but that is a big part of the story, which is why, again, I said earlier that I think the motivations are quite different from what's happening in Europe, where, uh, at least in the literature, uh, ideas of freedom and liberty and um, individualism is really the dominant. Not to say those things are not uh, relevant in Korean society, but in terms of the structural pressures that Koreans face, I think that's quite a remarkable thing in the Korean context. A core change over the past decades is the entry of women into the formal workforce. How did that happen? Is How is the government involved in this process? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a new thing. I think during the modernization drive, uh, we get this new identity of the factory girl uh, because the government created these policies to try to get the young people out of the countryside to work in the factories, the urban factories. And because Korea in the 1960s began with well, one of the main sectors that started, jump-started Korea's economy in the 1960s was the textile industry. They needed young girls to work uh, behind the sewing machines, essentially. So uh, they were encouraged to come to work in places like Dongdaemun, for example. Uh, and so you start to see an uptick in formal uh, female labor force participation. But even though it was still relatively low in the 1960s, 1963, for example, um, 37% of women worked. But that slowly increased over time, uh, such that today about 50% of uh, women work in the labor force. I think uh, more telling than the overall broad number is to break down labor force participation rates by the age group of women. So, for example, when we look at the younger women uh, in their 20s, about 70% of young women are working in the labor force. That number drops, or that percentage drops in the 30s to about 55% uh, before it comes back up in their 40s at about 65, 67%. Uh, And that's what we call the classic M-shaped curve for female labor force participation. It's important to note that the M-shaped curve is steeper or more pronounced in South Korea than even amongst its East Asian counterparts. You don't really see this M-shaped curve, and for example, in America, it just looks like an uptick in labor force participation in the 20s, and then sort of plateaus out and stays until women retire in their 60s or 70s or whatever it is. But the M-shaped curve is reflected in other Asian societies like Japan, but in Korea, it's even more pronounced. That is to say that it's a reflection of the fact that Korean women have a harder time balancing work and family life compared to other East Asian uh, women in other East Asian contexts. The government uh, has tried to do a lot of things to encourage women to both stay in the labor force, but also to have families, to marry and have uh, children and more children. It's unclear whether any of that is working. Uh, Right now, it looks like none of it is working. So on the family side, for example, they've universalized daycare. So it's free, universal daycare. So if you have children, you can uh, send them to daycare for free. That was intended to try to raise the fertility rate. That has not worked. And fertility rate, again, as I mentioned earlier, has dropped to its lowest point ever last year. There are several reasons why the universal daycare um, program is not working. One of one is that um, mothers don't feel that the quality of care they're getting at these public daycare centers are that good, and they're less likely to entrust their child uh, in those daycares. And also, uh, for the higher class uh, women, they're going to opt out of the public daycare and really invest or, you know, pay money for private daycare. And so there's a lot of, in, the, the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of inequality in the, in the care that's provided. There have been some sens- sensational news stories about uh, day- daycare workers abusing children. So maybe that's part of the reason why um, there's an attitude against these daycare centers. Uh, and also, the government's running out. They don't, running out of money. Um, there, there was a debate about two years ago, a uh, pretty public fight about two years ago between the local governments and the central government, uh, where the central government really wanted the local governments to help pick up the tab for these daycares, uh, and the local government didn't think that it was their responsibility because it was essentially a policy coming from the president. 
So there are all sorts of problems. Um, you know, they've done some really ad hoc sort of things, like try to, like, you know, make a space, a, a save a seat for pregnant women in subway trains, et cetera, things like that. None of that seems to be working. And and the government now is straight out paying for people to have children. So uh, if you have a child, the government will give you a, a subsidy. And if you have two children, they'll give you more subsidy. And if you have three children, they'll give you even more subsidy. I, I, I the, the numbers fluctuate. I remember at one point it was about $200 or 200,000 Korean won, which is about $175 a month for a child, but I'm not exactly sure if those numbers are holding now. The point is the government is trying to do a lot of things to encourage women, try to help women and families to maintain and grow their families in this precarious economy, and yet none of them seems to be working. On the work side, they to try to encourage women to continue to work, they've implemented several policies uh, such as maternity leaves, limitations on overworking, and try to change you know corporate culture to uh, not make it so that you have to stay so late at night or at least wait till your boss goes home or something like that. Um, none of that seems to be working as well. Uh, a lot of the female um, corporate employees that we talk to in our interviews will tell us that even uh, even though there are these either corporate level or government level policies to encourage women to go home early or encourage all employees to go home early, people don't. So informally, um, people feel like if they take advantage of these policies, such as a long maternity leave, that it might be great and they might have a job at the end of that leave, but they'll still be discriminated against because they'll still be considered not really committed to their jobs and to the company. So informally, even aside from these actual policies, uh, informally, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, showing that Korean women don't feel like they can take advantage of these policies that were intended to try to help them stay in the workforce and maintain families at the same time. Uh, it seems to me, at least in the Korean context still, pursuing career and pursuing family are still mutually exclusive. Does the government have any specific policy or any specific program regarding multicultural couples and their children? The government uh, was always has always been part of the story of uh, multicultural families in the sense that to solve the bachelor crisis, they really saw it as a crisis of uh, lower class men not being able to marry, especially the men that were in the countryside. It was the government that tried to step in and arrange these quote unquote marriage tours in the um, early 1990s with Korean men mostly from the countryside, farmers, uh, and trying to match make them with uh, women, the Korean Chinese women in Northeast China, the Chuzunjok. Uh, these marriage tours, again, were intended to solve this bachelor crisis because these lower class men were so not competitive on the marriage market. And the Korean women didn't want to be uh, wives of Korean farmers or, or live in the countryside for that matter. And so they were trying to outsource the brides. And so the government was involved in that way. Um, since then, uh, as I mentioned, there are over 300,000 marriage migrants. The pool of brides or the pool of uh, countries that these women are uh, coming from to marry the Korean men have diversified dramatically to include Southeast Asia. So after the Chosunjok and the Han Chinese, the third largest group is uh, Vietnamese women at about 15% of all marriage migrants in South Korea. And because there are now over 300,000 marriage migrants and they have children, uh, really the shift has focused, the government shift has focused from identifying potential pools of brides to now trying to think about how to assimilate them into uh, South Korean society. And I think the term multicultural is, is actually quite dishonest because the government's policies are not multicultural. It is not to celebrate multiple cultures. In fact, if you look at the government's policies, other people have studied this. If you look at the government curriculum in their, for example, social service programs for these multicultural brides, uh, it's really assimilationist. So things like learning the Korean language and also about family values. How do you deal with mother-in-laws, Korean mother-in-laws? Um, and how, how do you make, how do you cook and you know, cook for your, uh, your husband, Korean husband. So how do you make kimchi, for example? And these are the sorts of topics that dominate the curriculum in these uh, multicultural service centers. So the government, I think, has not 
done a very good job of celebrating multiculturalism, which is probably why a lot of multi uh, a lot of women in these multicultural families report a lot of grievances about living in Korean society and the fact that um, they feel like they're second class citizens. Uh, there's been cases of that as well. I think the multicultural family or this trend in multicultural family is going to be quite dramatically important as time goes on. So I already did mention that in 2014, about 5% of all births were from these multicultural families, so these biracial children. The proportion of children in Korean elementary schools that are biracial has gone up dramatically. And in certain areas where there are a lot of these multicultural families, some schools report up to about 80% of their schools are these biracial children. Part of the reason is because, one, there are a lot of multicultural families in these areas, but two, because the Korean families are, are pulling their children out of the schools. Uh, in a recent report, there was a story about Korean mothers who did not want their Korean children to go to school with these biracial Korean children. They're also Korean, obviously. And so they started pulling them out. So that what we're getting uh, potentially, at least in Seoul or some parts of Seoul, is a concentration of biracial children in certain schools and Korean children in other schools. So that's one thing to keep an eye on is the potential discrimination that these biracial children are going to face in Korean society. The other thing, if we think further, because the first batch quote unquote, of these biracial children are now coming of age, going to high school and starting to enter colleges. There are long-term implications. I just want to um, point you to a really remarkable Brookings Institute report written by uh, Professor Catherine Moon at Wellesley College. And in that report, she talks about the long-term implications of this demographic revolution. So for example, let's take uh, the unification policy. When you look at the government's unification policy articulated by the Ministry of Unification and other government agencies, clearly the justification for unification with North Korea is because Koreans are of the same ethnic group or ethnically homogeneous. So what happens to the fundamental justification for unification if it's based on ethnically homogeneous population when in fact the South Korean population is no longer ethnically homogeneous? So that's another, that's an implication. Uh, what happens when, uh, because uh, the you have mandatory military duty in South Korea. What happens when a significant number of biracial men uh, are have, having to serve in the Korean army? All of its ethnically driven nationalistic culture that's involved in uh, in the military. So that's another implication. Another implication that Catherine Moon uh, mentions in this report is the increasing divisions between what she calls "quote unquote" new Koreans. Uh, so as you know, there are thousands, tens of thousands now of North Korean uh, refugees or defectors in South Korea. And in her interview, she started seeing this pattern where North Korean refugees are criticizing these multicultural families for getting all sorts of these government subsidies and uh, welfare and support when they are the true Koreans, but they're not getting it. And then on the flip side, these multicultural families are criticizing uh, other groups, including Korean women, because they're the ones here to have children. They're the ones here to basically save uh, these lower class men um, by marrying them and having children and thus helping the nation out by increasing the fertility rate and all and those kinds of things. And so there's a narrative of who gets to belong in Korean society, either based on ethnic, racial categories or contribution to society or based on other factors. I think all this can only, all of these issues can only become more, again, dramatic and more salient and more important over time because what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot more biracial children coming of age in Korean society, potentially more uh, contest or conflict between the new between the new Koreans, either the North Korean defectors and the multicultural uh, families. And so I think this is really, uh, this is on top of the sheer fact that, again, Koreans and Korea is going to look physically different because of this new uh, racial ethnic composition. So for me, I think this is one of the most compelling issues. Uh, and I really do feel that Korea is going to be a different place in the next 20, 30 years. To conclude, a lot is going on on the Korean Peninsula and there are numerous changes in the Korean society. How should we try to understand these? How do we make sense of it? 
So what I'd like to do in this project is to show that these diverse non-family, uh, non-normative family structures are fundamentally related to each other. I think uh, a lot of the literature tends to be quite separate, so that senior people study senior citizens, study what's happening with them and their poverty rates and the suicide rate and their health. Uh, and then other people study uh, the migrant population, uh, the multicultural families, et cetera. And other people might study the never marrying population. But what I, lo- what I wanna do in this project is to show how these different household structures are fundamentally related to each other. Uh, so for example, the expansion of um, higher education and women's uh, work opportunities has led to certain groups being less competitive on the in the marriage market, like the lower class men. And because of that, they're either choosing to not marry at all or cannot marry, or they're choosing to start these multicultural families families with brides from or wives from outside of Korea. So I think that these family issues are fundamental, or these different types of family, household types, are fundamentally related to each other. And I want to show the specific mechanisms that they're tied to, to each other. I mean, forget about the project. I think another way of thinking about why this is important is to, or to understand what's going on, is to not just limit our analysis to post-1997 and and what's really happened with the economy, but to try to understand the long-term historical foundations, the macro structural foundations for uh, the demographic revolution. And as I mentioned, um, the government's policies to industrialize and the urbanization policies that they implemented, the expansion of tertiary education, higher education, and the political liberalization after 1987, how that led to this new uh, new generation culture. Uh, I think are the uh, foundations, the cultural, the economic, and the political foundations uh, that undergird this new demographic revolution. So already on the eve of financial crisis in 1997, when the country collapses, you already had these fundamental change. You had a highly urban population, a highly educated population with a lot of women going to school and going to work. And you have new freedoms, 10 years of enjoying freedoms by 1997. Uh, censorship laws were lifted, travel bans were lifted, and there's an influx of Western culture, uh, this rise of individualism, as I mentioned. The point I'm trying to make is that the groundwork was laid before the Asian financial crisis uh, in terms of, again, the economic, social, and political groundwork. And what happens after 1997 is that once the economy changes into the new neoliberal economy that we have today, all of these foundational factors come into play and you get the dramatic diversification of non-normative families, uh, household structures that don't conform to expected values and understandings of what a Korean family is. Professor Chang, thank you once again for participating on our podcast. Thanks for having me again. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.